Are you wanting to know how you can draw white fur or any white subject on white paper? In this tutorial, I'm going to show you exactly how I created this white dog on white paper. I'm Kirsty Rebecca and I make drawing and painting tutorials that are easy to follow even if you're just starting out. Most of these techniques and tips that I'll be talking about will be useful for any medium that you're working in like pastels, watercolour, acrylic, coloured pencil or even oil, but today I'm using a variety of different coloured pencil brands on white Claire Fontaine pastel matte paper. So the first step is the most important and that is to make sure that you choose a good reference photo. And this is a lot easier if you're working on your own project in comparison to commission, but you wanna choose a photo that has really high contrast, meaning that you can see the shadows and the highlights very clearly. So you can see the details a little bit easier. A lot of the time you'll see with photos of white dogs that it's so bright and overexposed that you can't actually see which direction the fur is going in because it's just a big white blob. You also want to make sure that you can see all of the details clearly. You don't want to use a photo that's taken on the other side of the room too far away or is too blurry. You want to be able to zoom in and see all those little individual hair details. Try to use a photo that was taken outside in natural lighting. Take the photo in the morning or the afternoon when the sun isn't as harsh as it would be in the middle of the day. That's the best time to take a photo outside. You can also take a photo in the shade outside and that way the dog is lit by natural light but not directly in the sunlight. When the sun is shining directly onto the dog, it can sometimes make the dog look really bright and like a big ball of white rather than just being able to see the shadows in the fur. So taking the photo in the shade or in the morning or afternoon can help stop that from happening. If the photo was taken inside, the fur colour can be distorted because of the different kinds of lighting and it's really common for the fur to look kind of yellow and not, not white at all. It looks almost dirty when the photos are taken inside and if you draw a photo that looks like that and you take those colours into your artwork, it will just make the dog look dirty and people won't understand that the actual reference photo looked like that in the first place. And the last tip is to make sure that you can see the eyes clearly. I always find that the eyes are what makes the portrait. So if they're completely hidden in shadow or they just look really black and you can't actually see the colors or the shape of the eyes, then I wouldn't use that photo. Now there are exceptions to all of these rules and if you're an experienced artist and you've drawn a lot of dog portraits before then you can pick and choose what you like and be able to change things how you like and you might be able to make up the fur detail if you've done enough portraits in the past but especially when you're first starting out I find that these tips are really useful to make sure that your drawing will look really good because you can copy the photo exactly without having to make up any of the details or the colours or the eyes. If you're working on a commission, it can be a little bit harder to get a good reference photo because sometimes the dog is deceased and you can't actually get another photo of the dog or it's for a friend and you can't physically take more photos. So if the reference photo isn't ideal, I would recommend politely turning down the commission. Explain that you don't believe that you can create a high quality portrait from this photo. If you're more experienced artist who's worked on enough pieces that you can you can actually create your best work from a substandard photo, then go for it, but it's not worth accepting the commission if you think that you can't achieve your best work. It will make the client unhappy because it's not the same quality as your previous work and you may get a bad reputation or because you've used a photo that you can't produce good results from. And there may be nothing wrong with your skills and your artwork, it's just that you've used a reference photo that was poor and you've reproduced that in your artwork. So I've chosen this photo to work with and at the moment it looks a little bright and the colours are a little too washed out for my liking so I'm going to alter it a bit before I start on my own artwork and I'll show you some tricks that will be really useful for working with white fur. I always have multiple reference photos for white animals or any animal actually that have all been edited differently for different reasons and I use them all in the process. So you can bring your photo into an editing program like Photoshop or Lightroom or an app on your phone or even just Microsoft PowerPoint. And honestly, I mainly use Microsoft PowerPoint for this because it's quick and easy. So the top left photo is the original photo. The bottom left is my main reference that I'll be using for most of my artwork. And this is the photo that I'll refer to the most and I'll try to make my artwork look mostly like this photo. 
So in this main reference, I've hyped up the contrast slightly so my highlights and shadows are more defined and I've also taken the brightness down a little bit so that the big white areas aren't as bright and this helped bring out some of the detail around the highlighted area. I've also changed the saturation and made the colour slightly more saturated so that you can see some of the warmer yellows, the ochres, the reds and the browns and you can also see some of the blues and purples in the lighter areas. The tiny photo next to it that's cropped of the eyes and the nose, I've just made this photo really bright so that I can clearly see all of the colours in those areas. The eyes are the most important part for me, so I make sure that I always make them a little bit brighter than the original photo shows. The top right photo is a high contrast photo, meaning that you can see the shadows between the curls and the clumps of fur a bit more clearly. This photo is useful if you can't quite see which direction the fur is going in your main photo or where the shadow starts or the highlights or anything like that. And the bottom right photo, I've just hyped up the saturation quite a lot so it's really easy to see those hidden colours that are in white fur. And I use this throughout my process to make sure I'm adding in some of those blues and yellows into those areas of the fur. And the last thing that I do is import my photo into an editing program like Photoshop or another program that has an eyedropper tool. And this step is the most important for me because it's the most useful for any type of animal or project that I'm working on to make sure that my colours are accurate. I don't always do this, but especially when I was first starting out, this was really useful to be able to train my eyes to see those hidden colours that I didn't think were originally there. For this I literally used Microsoft Paint, like the program that kids use to draw in, and I've just used the eyedropper tool on the bottom right there to take a sample of the colour from different areas of the dog, and then I've made swatches on the white background. And this is such a good exercise to do with any drawing because you can see colours that you didn't think were actually in the photo. As you can see, this white dog doesn't actually have any white fur areas at all. The, large, the lightest part of the fur is actually a really light blue or a really light cream colour. And this is the most important thing to remember when you're drawing white animals, is that the fur reflects the colours around it, so you'll most likely see a bunch of subtle colours because the fur is actually rarely just white. So I've transferred my reference photo using transfer paper onto my pastel mat and I'm starting out by adding in the lighter colours first and I'm using a cream and a light blue to basically fill in the first layer and I'm using some mid-tone browns and greys to get in some of those darker shadows around the curls as well so I don't lose my entire outline. And this layer is basically just to get some pigment down onto the paper so I have a base layer to work with so I'm not just going in with the darkest and the lightest colours just yet. I'm not worried about any of the details either because I'll be blending out this layer so any details that I've added will probably disappear with the blending and I'll have to redo them anyway. So I'm trying to work in smaller sections at a time so I don't lose track of where each curl or clump of fur is. In the first layer I like to use wax based pencils because I find that they blend out really well with odorless mineral spirits on this pastel matte paper and I like using the Derwent Drawing, the Caran d'Ache Luminance, the Derwent Pro Colour and even the Derwent Light Fast even though they say that they're oil based. I find that the polychromos don't blend out as smoothly and painterly as the other brands but I still love the polychromos for the details towards the end because the lead is harder which means that you can sharpen it to a finer point. And I'm blending out each section as I go with Odorless Mineral Spirits or OMS for short. If you've used this on watercolour paper before you probably would have noticed that you can add a fair amount of OMS to blend if you want to. But if you're working on pastel mat, try and use as little as possible. I dip my brush in the OMS and then dab off the excess on a cloth or onto a paper towel until the brush feels almost dry and then I start to blend. It takes a bit longer for the colours to blend smoothly this way but if you put too much on this paper it can leave a, like a slight stain around the area that you're working on and I find that's really hard to remove. It's not so much of a big deal if you're going to go over the top of the entire piece but when you're leaving the background white like this I really try and make sure that I've dabbed off the excess OMS before I go onto my pastel mat to avoid that. It also takes quite a lot longer to dry than on the watercolour paper so you'll want to definitely make sure that your paper is dry before going in with your next layer of pencil otherwise you may damage the paper. And as you can see the mineral spirits have blended the pigment pretty smoothly, it almost looks like a painting when it's done. So I'm working on the eyes and paying a bit more attention to the details here because it's important to get the eyes right from the start so you don't accidentally alter them as you build up your layers. 
They're very much in shadow in the photo, but I'm still going to start with some of the reds and the browns that I can see in there and then darken it as I continue to layer. And this way, some of those colors will still show through at the end and make it, a, make it look a little bit more interesting. As I continue along with the fur around the eyes, I'm purposely adding in those blues and yellows and the reddy browns into it that I saw in that edited photo that I did the swatches of the colors because it will really make the end result look a lot more interesting. People seem to be too afraid to use these kinds of colors because you don't immediately see them when you look at a white dog. But when you do the swatches on your editing program, you can clearly see that there are hints of them in there. I really like to exaggerate them in my own work though, and you don't need to do it as exaggerated as I do. I just really like the effect that it, that it gives. To make something look realistic, it's not about the perfect color, it's about getting your values correct. So you could paint this dog with even more blues in it or more yellows in it, and it's still gonna look like a white dog, just in a different kind of lighting, as long as your darks are dark enough and your lights are light enough. I find that a lot of people are trying to use just grays and blacks for the shadows of fur on white dogs, and I find that this can actually make the dog look old because it makes the fur look gray rather than giving the effect of the shadow. So I try and make sure that I'm using blues and browns and reds and ochres in the shadows rather than going straight to gray. Like I still do use gray in a lot of my pictures, but I um, glaze over the top of it with another color so it doesn't just stay gray. So I'm working on the nose and the fur around the nose area and I'm noticing that there's quite a lot more blues and purples in the fur here. Even the nose itself has a bit of a blue tinge to it. So just make sure that you check your reference photo and check your color swatches to see exactly what the color of the nose is. Because if you're just using black and gray, again like the fur, it, it sort of makes it look old and doesn't look as interesting and doesn't pop off the page as much as if you used a color like blue just mixed in with your darker colors like black as well. And I never really just use black by itself. And I know that people don't use black at all a lot of the time because they think that it makes the painting look flat. And I completely agree with that. I don't just use black by itself. I always mix in other colors with it. So it stops it looking flat. And it looks a, it actually looks darker when you mix in those blues and the reds and the browns into the black rather than having it just black. It kind of looks a bit flat. But yeah, I'm not against using black as long as you mix in other colors with it as well. If your artwork isn't looking as realistic as you'd like it to, or it's not looking as 3D or popping off the page as much as you'd like, then it could be that your values aren't quite right. Your darks may not be dark enough. So a good way to check your artwork is by taking a photo of it and then turn it into black and white and then compare it to a black and white version of your reference photo side by side. And I say this all the time, but you'll be able to see whether your darks need to be darker in comparison to your reference photo, and then you can change that on your own artwork. If you find that you're losing track of your clumps or your curls, then you can work in even smaller sections. And I've also seen people print out their reference photo and keep one finger on that area of their reference photo that they're working from. So when you look over from your artwork and back to your reference photo, your eyes go directly to where your finger is so that you don't lose your place. For me, I'm not too worried about getting each clump of fur exactly right. And I've honestly never done that for any commission in the past either. And you can't really tell. I've just made sure that any markings are accurate, that the eyes and the nose are as accurate as I can make them, and that the general outline is accurate. The actual fur detail is not that important as long as the fur or the curls are generally the right size, length and direction. You don't have to have every curl exactly right, so you don't stress too much about getting it perfect. It is totally up to you, of course, how much detail you want to put in each uh, clump of fur, so you can continue adding more and more layers on top of your work until you get all the detail that you like. But I'm not really that fussed about it. I look at my artwork from a few feet back when I'm drawing. I take a step back every now and then to see if it looks accurate from a distance because normally people don't have their face pressed against the artwork to see all the little minute details. And I know that with social media, there's a bit of pressure to have it really accurate like that and have all the little tiny pencil strokes in there because people can look at it really closely on their computer screens. But in real life, I really like artwork that looks accurate and um, realistic from a distance and then when you step closer you can really see the pencil strokes or the paintbrush strokes or whatever medium you're actually using. I like to be able to see that texture when I get up close to artwork. 
so I don't tend to spend too much time on tiny minute details that I won't see from a couple of feet back from your work. Also, when you look at animals in real life like this one, you don't usually see every strand of hair. You see the clumps and the curls of fur, and you'll be able to see the general gist of the fur texture. Unless you're really up close to the dog, obviously, you'll be able to see the little tiny hairs. But from a normal distance, a couple of feet away, you won't be able to see those tiny details. So I try and create my artwork like that as well. Because sometimes when you're adding in the tiny little details with a pencil, especially on this size artwork, it can look wiry because the pencil strokes are actually quite large in comparison to a real life piece of hair from that dog. So unless you're working on a really ridiculously large piece, I wouldn't bother putting in every single little pencil stroke if you don't want to. When I'm working on animals that have darker fur, I usually start by blocking in the shape of the curl or the clump of fur with the lightest color, but that's usually a shade of brown or gray or black or something like that, which shows up on the white paper. Then I can build up the shadows around it, but obviously you can't do that when you're working on white paper because the lightest color is very close to the color of the paper. So you kind of have to do it in reverse. So with white fur, especially curly fur, it's easier to try and think about filling in the shadows around the lighter clumps and curls and then add in some of the detail on top of the curl once you've defined where the shape of that curl is with the darker colours. If you're working in coloured pencil and you're struggling to get your white pencil to go on top of your first layer, there could be a few reasons why. Firstly, the white is never going to be opaque, like if you're working in pastels or paint. It's just not the nature of this medium. You could always use something like the brush and pencil products, like the, pow the uh, titanium white powder or the touch-up texture. But if you do use the brush and pencil products, I'd recommend using a rigid surface and sanded paper because the products aren't really designed to go onto papers that might bend like pastel mat. You can actually use pastel mat with the, with the titanium white and touch up, text, touch up texture, but make sure that you keep it flat while you're working on it and while you're storing until it's safely framed so that it, there's no way for it to bend. Anyway, some artists use things like gel pens, acrylic paint or gouache to go on top of coloured pencil for the highlights, which I also wouldn't recommend doing because all of these things are light fast and archival separately. But when you layer a water based medium on top of an oil or wax based medium like coloured pencil, it's not archival anymore and it could potentially have problems like chipping or flaking off in the future. So there are a few tips that I can share with you that may help. One of them is to use odorless mineral spirits or OMS or something similar. I know that you can get natural ones like um, Zestit, um, but anything like that which dissolves your pigment into your paper because dissolving the previous layer of pigment will help bring back some of that tooth of the paper. If you don't blend your pencil with OMS, it can layer up pigment quite quickly filling up the tooth of your paper and creating a slick, flat surface which your future layers of pencil will struggle to stick to. Second is to use pastel mat or a sanded paper. There is so much more tooth in these type of papers than on a smooth watercolour paper or a drawing paper. This is great because you can add more layers of pencil, allowing you to add lighter colours on top of darker colours a little bit easier. Three is to use a wax-based pencil to add in lighter colours on top. Wax-based pencils like Caran d'Ache Luminance and Prismacolor will work much better than your oil-based pencils like the Polychromos for adding more opaque colours and getting in that extra layer on top. I actually love using the Derwent Drawing Chinese White for this and that's the pencil you see me use quite a lot in this piece. It's the one with the red barrel with the white end. It gets quite short, so I've put it inside a pencil extender, which is that silver contraption you see me use all the time. And I found this to be the most opaque white colored pencil that I could find. And it seems to go on top of the other layers quite easily as well. Also making sure that you keep your pencil really sharp as well will really help out to add in those extra details on top. And so I'm using that Derwent Drawing Chinese White to define some of the curls and to bring out some of the highlights, but I'm actually going back through with a really light blue or a cream color, depending on the area, over the top of that white, just to glaze some of that color on it so that it doesn't look so harsh and stark. 
And I'm just building up those layers, switching between the white and the shadow colors and then blending them with OMS when I feel like I need to smooth out some of the pencil strokes. And then I just go back through and glaze over some of the shadows and the highlight areas to make them less harsh. And when you glaze those colors over the top, it will the color below will still show through, but it will change what the color looks like a little bit and it will blend in a little bit better with the entire drawing as a whole. And as you can see, the dog looks white, but it's not really white at all, especially when you look at it in comparison to the white of the paper. This tutorial on the screen shows you how to do all different types of fur with different techniques using colored pencil. So click on that and I'll see you over there. <laughs>